Hi, everyone, and welcome to Kingsley Gate in the Spotlight, uh, Her Corner's Office, bringing you inspiring stories of leading women executives, taking us through their journeys of opportunity, challenges, and achievements that brought them to their destination of success today. I am Muna Awadova, partner with Kingsley Gate, and I'm honored to be joined here today by our special guest, Muna Dandan. Hi, Muna. Hi there. Muna is a trusted advisor to the board of the Dubai Financial Services Authority and general counsel of the world-class financial services regulator of the Dubai International Financial Center. Wearing several hats as a legal advisor to the board of directors and responsible for managing the business of the board and its various committees, Muna is also currently head of policy and legal department and responsible for managing all regulatory and legal affairs of the DFSA. With over two decades and global ex experience and expertise, Muna's career spans from London, Hong Kong to Dubai, having worked for global recognized institutions such as Baker McKinsey, HSBC, and Barclays, demonstrating deep expertise in ad and advising multi-billion dollar corporates across Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. In her current role, she's part of the senior leadership team of the Dubai Financial Services Authority, recognized international in recognized internationally as a world-class financial service regulator. She is an advocate for women in leadership and on boards. Welcome, Muna. And what a fascinating background. And thank you so much for joining us and for us to listen and hear much more about your background and experience in our episode today. Thank you for having me, Mona. That's wonderful. I think I would like to start with your fascinating background and would like to hear a little bit more. And if you can share with us and the audience um, about your unique combined and the combination of your background and how that has impacted your career to date. Well, Mona, um, I'm half Lebanese and half Scottish. And as you mentioned, I've lived uh, across the Arabian Gulf. Hong Kong and uh, London. I also have spent a lot of time in Australia. That's where my family now live. So um, I feel that my background and my experience of working with so many different cultures has been immensely valuable in my career. Um, firstly, I think I connect quite quickly with people, regardless of where they're from, their backgrounds, etc. And I think that's very important as a lawyer because you mentioned trusted advisor and that's so key. Uh, you have to be trusted uh, if you're gonna be a successful lawyer, you have to earn trust quickly. And I think uh, my, my, my diverse background and my um, experience working with so many different cultures has really helped me uh, connect with people quickly. I think also understanding different value systems and what drives different people from different cultures has been invest immensely valuable. Um, I'll give you an example, um, certain cultures don't want to bring the um, bad bad news to the boss. So when when you're when you're getting an update from the team, it's always everything is going fantastically well, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, as I as I'm sure we both know, things life is never always rosy. So um, when I'm dealing with those particular cultures, I will always challenge. I will dig down. I will dig it out of them. What what is what the bad news is? Because I want to know the bad news first because I want to develop solutions. But as I said, certain cultures, it's just, it's it, they, they don't feel comfortable. So uh, you have to be aware of that. And I've seen other colleagues not, not uh, be aware of that. And the bad news has been like uh, simmering and then exploded. Um, and that's not, it's not been good. So yeah, it's been very valuable. Excellent. And if we go to, you know, one of the most popular questions we ask uh, at our episode is, if we take a look at, you know, two key decisions that you have made across your career um, or even across your 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 professional life, what would those two most important decisions be and and why? Well, I think the first one was to study law. So I I was a scholarship student at my school and back in the day, it was if you were, you know, the the, the bright kid, then you were going to be a doctor. No question. So I study all the sciences and uh, I was planning. I had a, I was offered places at medical schools. And in my final year at school, I decided not 
to do um, sports on a Wednesday afternoon, I persuaded my school to let me go to the local hospital um, to uh, volunteer because I wanted to understand what it was like to work there. And it was the best decision I ever made because I absolutely hated it. I hated the fact that um, the health system was so overstretched that I, I could see patients were not getting sometimes the best care. And um, so uh, right then and there, I switched. And I remember my father saying to me, well, you know, you're a good student. If you're not going to be a doctor, why don't you study law? And I remember holding my head in my hands going, law is so boring. And then he said, well, look, at least it's a... a a recognized degree um, and it will open doors for you even if you don't want to be a lawyer. So I did law and oh I'm so glad I did because I ended up loving it um, and um, so that was something that uh, that was a decision a really good decision that I made. Um, I think the second decision I made that was very valuable to me in my career was um, I I did very well at my first law firm. I was lucky enough to be on the biggest case that the, the law firm had and we were successful and it was um, a very high profile case. And um, I had, if you like, earned my stripes at the law firm. So I was on you know, a trajectory to, to be successful, to get partnership. Um, I was, it was a, a, a lovely law firm in Mayfair and I lived in a, a lovely part of London. So life was very, very good. And I made the decision uh, to leave Uproot and go to Hong Kong, where I'd never been before, and um, experience life there. And I think it was because I'd grown up in Bahrain. I lived a very different life. And in London, all my friends from law school were settling down, getting married, having children, getting a mortgage. And I just knew that there was a bigger and more exciting world out there. So that was the second decision I made, which I'm very glad I did, is to completely... Um, turn my back on a, a very comfortable life and try something uh, which was completely outside my comfort zone in Asia, where I had, uh, as I said, I'd never been to Hong Kong before. Um, and I accepted, I accepted the job without visiting Hong Kong. I was interviewed in London. So even more risky, but it turned out to be a fantastic decision. And then I'd probably need to just ask another question around your, your transfer relocation to the Gulf again. So then you moved to the Middle East. What drove that decision, if I may ask? Well, that was actually driven by my husband. So he was a partner with Arthur Anderson Consulting. And I, you might remember the Enron scandal and Anderson went bust very quickly as a company. So he was offered um, three jobs. One was in Shanghai, one was in Moscow and one was in Dubai. And I said, oh, well, we must go to Dubai. It made sense because I, I was from, you know, I'd grown up in Bahrain, I knew the region. And I also knew I would have more chance of continuing my career in Dubai than in Moscow or Shanghai, where you had to speak uh, the language. So that's how we ended up here. Okay, thank you for that. And, you know, just making the introduction to your background, to your responsibilities, uh, to really the shift that you have made uh, from law firms into, you know, financial institutions, and now a regulatory authority. Um, I mean, you must have found different leadership styles. We're keen to know if you can shed some light around your leadership style and maybe some methods, you know, how you would harvest culture and employee engagement in your environment. And maybe you can also share a little bit of, across your career and some of the differences. Well, you're, you're, you're very... Uh... I'm correct in that uh, working in a big um, American law firm requires a particular leadership style, um, which is very different from when you're running a legal team in a in an international bank. Um, and again, you know, different again when when I when I joined the regulator. I mean, I think one thing that's been consistent throughout my career is that uh, my my leadership style is high challenge but high support. I really like to um, stretch. My, my team members, I want them, as I said, my, my own experience of pushing myself outside of my comfort zone was a very positive one. And so I always try and do that with my team. I try and push them to do different things. Um, my team currently, um, I have sort of three specialist sub, sub teams within my team, but I'm always encouraging people to work across because I want them to have a broad experience. Um, I want them to do different things, not to become too specialized too early. So yes, high challenge, but also um, high support. I, I, I support wherever I can. My view is that um, 
I'm there to develop people. I'm there to bring the best out of people. And if if I have a strong team, then then that reflects, you know, well, I, I will reap benefits of that. So it's um, it's very important to support my people to get the best out of them. And so was there a raw model that you had, um, you know, throughout your career uh, or a mentor that you worked with um, that actually have helped you acquire or develop your own leadership style? Um, early on in my career, I, I actually didn't have a role model. It was just unfortunate circumstance. But the the law firms I was at, the, it, I, I didn't. My first law firm, I didn't have a, a role model. And then when I moved um, to Hong Kong, I moved to join somebody in his team, and he left um, three months after I joined. So I was kind of on my own. So um, and and law firms sometimes or often have a culture that it's up to you to build your own business to have your own clients. So. You, you tend to work um, alone more more often than in other kind of organizations. Um, but I think um, the person that was most uh, important to me and I, I learned the most from was actually my husband, who sadly passed away um, 15 years ago. But he, when I saw how he took care of his team so well when, when Anderson's collapsed, I mean, it was such a huge shock to the world. Such a well-known corporation went from being, you know, this, this huge um, conglomerate across the world with thousands, tens of thousands of, of employees. It was gone in, in three months. It was so quick. Um, and his partners, I saw a lot of his partners just thought of themselves and they were just interested in finding a new role for themselves. And they were also very bitter about what had happened. I mean, you, you work extremely hard to get partnership and, you know, one out of maybe 10 gets it. And then to have that taken away from you. But my husband was completely different. He was totally calm. He was not bitter. He was not um, phased by this shock. And he spent all his energy on making sure his team found other roles in other companies. He used his contacts. He supported them. He he mentored them. He helped them. And I'm in the background going, wait a minute. What about you? <laughs> you know, you need to you need to make sure you find stuff. But he 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 was not. And he said to me, I, I will I will make sure all my team are fine first and then I'll look after myself. And he he just had this inner confidence in his abilities. Um, so I, I learned a lot from that, how important it was. And, and those people, I mean, his he universally, people that have worked for him still to this day, talk about what a great leader he was um, and how much they enjoyed working with him. So, you know, he really his his loyalty to his team reaped, reaped benefits for him. Um, and a lot of the roles that and, and the, the business that he got after that was through his own network because people knew what a good guy he was. Um, so I, I've learned from that. And I think that's why I'm so supportive of my team. And I see it. You know, I see it that the more support you give people, uh, the more loyal they'll be. And, you know, the better, the, the quicker they'll develop in their careers. So I, I've been told by headhunters that I have one of the strongest legal teams in the in, in the region, and I think that's true. I do, and and loyal. In fact, a headhunter contacted me the other day, and he said, "I've been trying to uh, attract people from your team for three years, and nobody will come." <laughs> <laughs> Which is an amazing sign. That's exactly what you have yeah, mentioned. That's kind of that loyalty and 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 that commitment to the team and the environment that you're creating. So that's definitely a testament to your leadership um, style, Buna. That, that's that's uh, great. Yeah. And uh, if, if I, I mean, as we're talking about the Middle East and uh, us operating in the Gulf and working in the Gulf um, and, and looking at women that obviously there's a huge um, emphasis and drive for women in the workplace. But still, you know, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts around some of the barriers that women still face in the workplace um, and, and just to get your thoughts and feel on what can be done um, in, in breaking some of those barriers? Um, yes, I mean, I'll start with, with a, a couple of positives of, of, around being a woman in the Middle East, because I think people's perceptions of the Middle East are very, um, um, I guess, outdated and, and, quite, and quite black and white. Um, I have found that certainly Dubai has been the best place on earth to be a single mother. Um, as I said, I was widowed when my children were very young, so two and four. But I have managed to juggle my, my work commitments. I never missed a sports day. I never missed a school concert. Um, the Middle East has been fantastic at that. 
um, we tend to work, um, if you like, normal hours here. Um, I can tell you that in Asia, hours are much, much longer. But uh, I'm glad to say that the culture here is that people do a, a hard day's work, but they don't have to stay late into the night usually or, or at weekends. There isn't quite the same culture as you have in some other cities. So that's been fantastic. I also found that um, people respected women in the workplace here more than I had seen in other countries. Um, there wasn't the same kind of, um, my, my daughters would call it um, toxic masculinity in the workplace. Um, there wasn't this kind of um, sort of macho ego thing. I, I haven't seen it anywhere, actually. Um, but that was quite prevalent in London and, and in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I found that very positive about being in Dubai. But I think generally, and it's not just the Middle East, I think it's, it's across the board. Um, I think um, there is still the problem that men are judged on their potential and women are judged on their experience. So men men just have more opportunities than women. I, I just see it. I see it all the time in, in, in when I'm sitting in on recruitment. Um, people are people will give men, men more the benefit of the doubt. You know, he doesn't he hasn't done this in his career yet, but I think he has the potential. But I just don't see that with women. It's it the, it's it's their experience that counts. Women are also still unfortunately judged more on their appearance. People, as long as a man is um, presentable and clean um, and turns up in a suit, people don't really notice what he looks like. But um, women are judged. Uh, if they're too feminine looking, they're judged if they're too masculine looking, they're judged if they're not well groomed. There's more of a, that they're punished more for the, for the way they look, which I find um, is really surprising in this day and age, but I, I, I do see it. I do see it and I call people out on it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, also, uh, as, uh, sorry, just, just one person that springs to mind when I say that, um, the, the the managing partner of my firm was Christine Lagarde um, at Baker McKenzie. So she's now president of the European Central Bank. She was the Minister of Economy and Finance in France. So she's done exceptionally well in her career. And I remember when I was at Baker McKenzie and she was our, our managing partner, I remember thinking how well she worked the room and how she was universally respected across the firm, and particularly by by the men. And I thought that a key factor was she was quite, and she was androgynous looking. She's she's tall. I think she's about five ten. So you know she would always wear a navy blue suit or a black trouser suit, always a trouser suit, um, with just a very plain white blouse. She has short hair, so she would she wouldn't look out of place in a room full of men. And I always thought that was one of her superpowers. That was a that was important. Unfortunately, um, that that still is important. The way that you look uh, as a woman. Um, so I think that unfortunately those gender disparities are still are still there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we've also heard you know areas around you know breaking the ceiling and 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 you know breaking the barriers. What what would be some advice that you would give to women that potentially you know we're, we were looking at men are judged by their potential, women are judged by their experience. From a a woman's position, you know, at a workplace, um, what what would be an advice in in that area to to kind of become or be or do more of or less of? Um, so that is a very um, interesting question. Um, I think that we can't change those perceptions overnight, um, as as and as unfair, unfair as they are, I think complaining about it and calling it out doesn't necessarily um, lead to you know, success. I think we've got to understand those challenges and, and do what we can to play to our strengths. So as, as women, we, we do have to unfortunately um, put ourselves in positions where we can get the good experience. Because as I said, it's going to, we're going to be judged on that. So if we if we need to go and do further training, if we need to add a qualification to our our resume. Unfortunately, we do need to go out and do that because mm -hmm. that's what will open the doors. Um, finding a good mentor is um, mm -hmm. extremely important. It's it's difficult. 
it's more difficult as a woman. Um, unfortunately, women in the workplace still are not as open to easing the path for other women. Men do it for other men much more instinctively almost. Women are st it's still not something that's automatically natural to them. And I, I, um, I, I yeah, I, so I think, I think that what's important is to have a very good support group of women outside the workplace. And I do, I have a, a, a group of friends who are female professionals like I am. And we, we help each other in, in so many ways um, because we can talk about issues in the workplace free of, of, you know, worrying how it would be perceived because this group are not within my workplace, but they've had similar experiences. So I find that very useful. Um, and finding, I mean, what is, more and more, I think men are open to being mentors to women and see the challenges that women face. I mean, men have daughters, they see the struggles their daughters have in the workplace. So I do think that is um, becoming more of an option. And I've had um, some, a couple of, of, of good male mentors in my life. Um, but you do need to find that mentor and, and, and sometimes several. And I think it's also very helpful to have, um, I think it's called reverse mentorship, but I, 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 I try and do this myself within an organization. Build relationships with people underneath you, perhaps in other teams, because you need to understand how more junior members of staff perceive you. It's unlikely that your direct team are going to tell you, but mm. I have built relationships with people in other teams in my organization. And I go out for coffee with them and I, I say to them, now, come on, what are people saying about me? You know, what, 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 what are people saying about the senior leadership generally? You know, what, what are we getting wrong? What are we getting right? And I think yeah. that is really, really valuable because, um, you know, if, if the people beneath you are not happy, um, then the organization is not going to do well. And you need to hear it. You need to understand it. You need to be told. You need to have your ear to the ground. So, yeah, mentors above and, and mentors below, I think, are very important. Example of where men are judged on their um, potential and women are judged on their experience, I've seen in recruitment for boards. So it is opening up. I am seeing a lot more opportunities now for women. I, I'm seeing boards actually asking headhunters uh, to bring lists of women because I think everybody is aware that companies perform much better when there's gender balance on, on boards and through the senior leadership team. But I still think it's the case that men are judged on potential, women on experience. And what I'd say to women who want to get on boards, I would say, pick up board roles that aren't remunerated. Those tend to be the less popular ones so you'll have more chance of getting those but once you've got a few of those on your cv it opens up doors because then you can demonstrate the experience and that for women can often be more important that, than for men because of this um this bias this unconscious bias that we still suffer from excellent thank you and one element you have mentioned which is quite important is about you know women being able to pave the road and support other women in and I believe you've got your team is what is the percentage of the uh... oh I've, I've, I've adjusted the balance um, recently but at one stage 80 uh, percent female um mm -hmm. so I I my team had, uh, had gone the other way to the the usual so um and look I what I think is very important is to include women on the recruitment team so mm -hmm. I always come in at the the final stage of recruitment for my team. Um, I always make sure that there are women on the, the, the first, in first, second interviews. I think that's really important because women see things in other women that, that men might miss, as I said, because of this whole unfortunate um, unconscious bias that, that men um, are judged on, potential women on, 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 on experience. So, um, and I mean, it just, it's just the case that, I mean, certainly in my profession, it's important to be very good on the detail if you're a lawyer. And I find that, that women more often than men um, are, are good on detail. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a generalization, um, of course. 
But certainly in my own experience, uh, I, the women have, have, that I've I've hired have just been stronger than the, the, than the male candidates. Um, and I did, at, at one stage, I did have to adjust it and say to my HR team, okay, I need more... <laughs> I need more CVs from men. <laughs> this is this is getting too female heavy. Yeah, oh, gender yeah. balance, right? That's what is important and 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 what we strive for as well. And so, from that regard, uh, can I? That's more a personal question. Have you ever been discouraged to a to a point that you would quit? Um, and and you know, what would you do to encourage yourself at that point and 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 other women? Not uh, I. I yeah, I, I have not myself been discouraged to the point I would quit because for me, when life gets hard, I double down and I fight. Um, mm -hmm. I it's just my that's the way I, I respond to situations. Um, so there have been times in my career which have been extremely hard, um, but I have not wanted to quit my profession. Uh, I have just, you know, fought and worked and worked and changed the situation. Um, I mean, sometimes you can try everything. <laughs> Um, to improve a situation. Um, usually it's around personal relationships, I find, in, in the workplace. Um, I mean, by the time you get to a relatively senior role in, in most organizations, you're good at what you do. It's just how you, um, it, it's what, what, the, what the chemistry is between you and, and, and I guess the people above you that will determine how well you do um, overall. Um, and... I, I would say that there comes a point where if things are just not working the way you want them to, then you have to you have to leave that organization and go elsewhere. Because sometimes it's it's the the leadership in the organization is um, strong, ingrained. They've created their own powerhouse, and you know there's no point beating your head against a, a wall. Leave, go somewhere else where you're where you're valued. But I would I would never I I'd be very sad if if women gave up their careers because they felt discouraged. There's always a different way. There's always a a a, a, a way out. And so, if we take a look at you know the region or or some of the organizations you have dealt with, um and and have had dealings with and and operate across uh, some of their uh, leadership or sitting on boards. What would you uh, kind of be able to share with us around um, what can leaders do to promote and empower diversity within uh, within their organizations? Hmm. Well, as I said, I think it's extremely important to include females on on the in the recruitment process. Um, um, I also think, and I mean this is this is not news, but Flexible working is is very very important. You know, it's I, I I see more often than not when I lose good people or when the organisation loses good females, it's because they just can't handle all the pressure of the family, uh, you know, kids, husbands, whatever, aged parents, whatever it is. Then, and and that is that is just so sad because I've seen such good talent walk out the door. Um, I wish people were less concerned or scared about flexible working. Um, there is still this fear that people will not, you know, will not do as do do as much work as hard if they're allowed to work from home more often or work from another country for a short period of time. And I, I wish I wish people were more open to it um, because I, I think it's key to keep women in, in the workplace. Yeah, well, that's a nice segue to, you know, looking at uh, working from home or flexible working uh, with your, you know, I would probably say intensity of, of responsibilities and work that you manage and operate. Muna, how do you balance? You know, you've got you were just mentioned about your beautiful daughters, um, you know, career, personal life, hobbies. You know, is there such thing as balance, and 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 how would you how do you balance it? I don't I don't believe there is. You can't have it all. You absolutely can't. Um, I, I you you can just um, juggle as best you can and congratulate congratulate yourself that you've got through each day. If you're managing to hold down a career and have a family, 
and still have a bit of a personal life, then you're a superstar. And I, I think I think we should stop um, pretending that it's any other way because it's not. Um, and I mean, you know, I, I I know one person who I can truly say balances a high powered career uh, with family and passion. He he has a lot of um, he's, he's passionate about a lot of sporting things, but it's because his family are grown up now, um, and so he doesn't have to uh, spend time. And actually, you know, while they were young, he had a wife doing all of that. But um, most people at my level have given up their hobbies, their passions, unfortunately. Um, but something has to give. It is, it's just not possible to have it all. And I think we make ourselves miserable by um, believing in that myth. So I accept that I can't have it all. I accept that um, I can't be an amazing hostess. Uh, I, I, I love to have wonderful dinner parties. But a long time ago, I realized that I, I didn't have the time to, to cook myself. Um, so, I mean, the way I try and achieve the best balance I can is I simplify things as much as possible. So mm -hmm. I, I have dinner parties, but I pay for caterers. Um, I, I keep my life as simple as possible. I have one credit card. Um, I have, you know, one set of bank accounts. Um, I simplify all the administration, I guess, in life mm -hmm. as much as I can. And um, I delegate. I delegate whatever I can delegate so that I can spend my quality time at work with my children and um, a little bit of time on the things that I enjoy outside of those things. Mm -hmm. And and also having that support system that you mentioned, which is as well women um, yes. that you also connect with, which is, which is extremely important. No, that's uh, uh, that, that's a kind of, you know, four elements bringing together. No, thank you so much. And so would be interesting to know what has been the greatest success and, and what has been, you know, the biggest lessons that you have had um, across your career? Um, gosh, greatest success. Um, I mean, I won some pretty big cases uh, in my career. Uh, my, in, early on in my career, I, I won a, a landmark um, decision that became a, a bit of a legal precedent. And I was, um, I was approached by a publishing company to actually write a book on this case. So I suppose that was probably one of my greatest successes. Um, but I, I, I've, I've done some you know, pretty interesting work. Um, I mean, I think just getting this far <laughs> has probably been my my greatest success because it, it has not been easy. You know, the, the, the I mean, life never is. Um, but I guess, yeah, um, still still enjoying what I do, um, mm -hmm. and having had a long career as I have. Um, uh, ha having the courage, as I said, to jump out of my comfort zone, um, uh, move countries, move from a law firm into private practice. And, and I've done so many different kinds of law. I mean, I started off doing media law. I did sports law. I did environmental law. So I've moved around. Um, and I think if, if my the way I would quantify success is the fact that I've managed to do all that um, and still uh, really enjoy what I do all these years on. Mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, sorry, what was the second question? The biggest lessons. Uh, biggest lessons. Um, yeah. Yes, I think um, well, biggest lessons. There have been so many, but <laughs> probably, yeah, build, uh, spend time on your team, put your team first, support your team, and you'll reap the benefits of that. Um, mm. Be good to people, take care of people, give them good work to do, uh, make their working conditions uh, as, as pleasant as they as they can be, and then they'll want to get out of bed and come into work for you. And then that's, um, that's a gift. Um, I think also don't panic if you don't know what you want to do when it, 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 in your 20s. So as I said, I, I was going to be a doctor, and then I had a complete change of direction and I, I I really didn't like the idea of being a lawyer I, my my concept of lawyers was boring people that did boring work um sitting in office by themselves but actually I ended up loving it so um don't be afraid to try different things and um push yourself challenge yourself mm -hmm. 
And so, yeah, that was that was kind of trying to see if you have any other key messages to our audience um, or any additional advice to what you have shared. Any last words, Mona? Uh, <laughs> uh, if you're not happy doing what you do, what you do, try something else. Don't be afraid. Life is long. Um, we our careers um, are going to be longer than our parents' generation. Um, it's going to be, I think it's going to become the norm uh, that people have two or three careers in their lives. Uh, in our parents' generation, it was not unusual to, to join an organization and stay there for 40 years. That's, that's gone. So um, I think, um, but yeah, be, be brave, be prepared to try things that are outside your comfort zone. Um, be prepared to to move country and seek out opportunities, and of course, do what you enjoy, because then you'll it, it won't feel like work. Great. Well, as we are coming to the end of our today's episode, Thanks so much, Muna, for uh, sharing your story with us, and we would like to wish you uh, all the continuous success in your journey ahead. Uh, and thank you to our viewers for tuning in for yet another inspiring story by Muna Dandan. And we would like to um, uh, invite you to stream more inspiring stories from our website at kingsdgate.com. Until our next episode, thank you and goodbye. Mm -hmm.